All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome morning. to class three. Good morning, Michael. Good morning. Uh, so morning. good to see everybody. Look at all of us. This is a great group. And I was just saying what beautiful work you guys are turning in. Um, I really, so many people are challenging themselves, trying difficult things, trying new things. And I really appreciate it. I know that whenever I take classes or workshops, it's it's baffling because you want to do good work, but you're also trying and you're experimenting. And I urge you to err on the side of experimentation. It's, you know, it's always fun to submit your work and have it praised and uh, get good feedback, nice things said. But truthfully, we're here for these uh, seven weeks together to learn and to try new things. And for a lot of you, probably the split primary palette, which is what we're going to be using most of the time, is probably pretty new for you. And yeah. even if it's not, you're probably using different colors than you normally use. So um, they're not all going to work. Whenever we're trying new things, whenever we're pushing ourselves, whenever we're experimenting, uh, <laughs> there's bound to be a couple of bumps. And, uh, you know, let's celebrate those as well, because, uh, you know, that means we're pushing ourselves and trying something different. So anyways, I appreciate you guys doing the work, sharing the work and uh, talking with each other. <laughs> Um, I love seeing your comments between each other and everything else. So thank you guys for that. Um, we took a quick vote right before we started the video here that we are going to skip the critique today or at least move it to the end of class. Um, I do have three different things I want to show you guys. Today's going to be action packed <laughs> as far as action uh, at the easel. Um, I want to share uh, some examples of things I mentioned in the handouts. In the email and also on the Padlet, you guys will see that I sent out two new um, things. Let me pull it up so I'm looking at it. Um, I quickly made two new, and so none of my previous students have seen these yet, the split primary palette to achieve goal and transparent and opaque paints. So the split primary palette to achieve goal uh, goes back to last class, which is, you know, these are notes that I kind of wrote based on last week's class a little bit and just kind of reminders and um, also some good information going forward. And then the transparent and opaque paints is going to be one of the primary subjects for today. Um, that's not something I've been able to cover as well in the past just due to time constraints and everything. So I thought that that might be really useful for a lot of you to understand the wins and whys of transparent paint and the wins and whys of opaque paint. A lot of us just pick up tubes of paint because we think it has a pretty color on the uh, little color swatch and just start using it without the knowledge that the, the transparent paints and semi-transparent paints and semi-opaque and opaque paints all behave quite differently. And I'm sure you've had that frustration where you're like, why is this color just not doing what I wanted it to do? Um, and it may be it's not getting the transparent glow that you were hoping. It's not letting light uh, pass through it. Or it may be it's not covering. I need this paint to cover. You know, I've got a mistake I need covered or whatever, a blemish on the canvas, whatever it is. Or I just want to put a nice, thick, solid piece of paint on this place and it's not doing it. And so you might be using a transparent paint when an opaque paint would be much better suited for your needs. The thing I want to start with, um, well, first I'm going to start with a reminder to please uh, mute yourself. When I went back and watched last week's uh, class, there was a lot of background noise. So if you're not, literally, if you're not talking or asking a question, please keep it muted. When I'm up at the easel, I'm not able to go through and uh, mute you guys. Um, when I'm here at the computer, I can actually mute you. How powerful am I when I'm at the computer? But up there, um, so just remember, you know, I love having you guys respond and ask questions while I'm painting, but please remember to mute afterwards. Um, great. That's that'll be really good. Makes the video just that much better for anybody who's not in the live class to or when you're reviewing it to make it that much easier to rewatch and hear. Um, what I want to start with, you guys saw my uh, painting at the easel. If you were with me 
last semester. Oh, sorry. Hold on one second. Wrong button here. Trying to change cameras. Um, if you were with me last semester, this is the painting I finished with. Um, so it was about, um, we, it was, the last class was tonalism. So we were keeping it within a fairly uh, limited palette. You can see kind of grays and some browns, a um, little bit of gold and orange in there. Um, let me see, go ahead and pin that. And uh, anyways, yesterday, last night, I began to add some fog into it. Um, just because I'm, and I'm going to go back in and I'm going to add more light and color into that fog bank. I wanted there to be a bit of a separation previously that the darks were just a big dark mass through it without any split. Um, so by adding a little bit of haze, a little bit of fog, um, and it also adds to the feeling of early morning for me, at least in the Oregon, we almost always have a bit of fog and haze sitting around, which I think adds a sense of mystery and magic. To the paintings. I also went in and added a little bit of cool purple into the back trees to push those back. But what I'm going to do today with this painting is I'm going to show you scumbling and I'm going to show you a little bit about glazing. Glazing to darken and glazing to cool in this instance because the water and the sky are too similar in value, right? The sky in the reflection and generally Here's a quick note for those of you note takers. Generally, the reflections in water are not as dark as the darkest areas, and they're not as light as the lightest areas. Generally, again, this is just a kind of a guideline. If you're wondering, why does my water not look right? The water will be generally just not quite as vibrant as the thing it's reflecting. So my reflection in the water is a little bit light for me, a little bit um, too bright. So what I'm going to attempt, <laughs> I'm going to, uh, hopefully you guys aren't going to watch a car accident here on my canvas, um, but what I'm going to attempt to do is I'm going to glaze in some cool or some, some blues and some maybe grays a little bit into that just to darken especially where the water comes closer to us towards the bottom of the canvas. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to scumble in as if that fog is catching some of that light a little more. So some areas where the light is sneaking through, like if you look at the big roundy tree on the right side, there's a little, you can see the light coming down along the left side of that right tree. Some of that light is inevitably going to hit that fog in that area. And I also want to let some of the light be coming across. So I got to kind of figure that out geometrically where the light would be hitting the fog and where the fog would be in the shadow. Are you doing this on a dry painting? Yes. So that's a very good point. Yes. Both scumbling and so scumbling is basically adding a very little bits of paint and kind of scrubbing it across the surface. So just by the description of it, you know that the surface has to be dry, right? So, and then for glazing, I'm gonna take a little bit of uh, either uh, like a Gamsol, a little bit of paint thinner, or I can use some medium if I want to, like a liquid or a Galkid gel or whatever it is, something that's gonna thin the paint out. I want to use generally when glazing, I want to use transparent or semi-transparent paint. You can glaze with semi-opaque and opaque, but you're asking, it's going to cover a lot more. It's like having a stained glass that you can see right through. It just kind of changes the color versus like a tempered glass where, you know, you can barely see through Like you can see like the outlines of the figures walking behind it versus a frosted glass where you can barely see. You can tell it's night or day behind the glass, but that's about it. Does that make sense? So using transparent is like a really, just like putting a, like almost like look, looking through colored sunglasses. Semi-transparent would be like looking through uh, dirty sunglasses maybe. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, and then the others. 
So that's important to remember when you're glazing and you're just like, I don't know what's going on. First thing is, hopefully your painting's very dry. And do remember if you're adding like a little bit of Gamsol, like a paint thinner to your um, paint to make it a glazing, you know, to thin it down and make it more transparent, you may reactivate the painting underneath if it's not fully dry. So this painting has been drying for a month at least, I think, since our last class, um, probably a month and a half. I don't think I went in and did too much more between classes. So I'm hoping, hoping, sometimes it surprises you oil paints can take up to six months to dry um so just be aware of that often you kind of start in a small corner or start in a small spot and or i'll take my paper towel and just kind of rub pretty hard into an area and see if the painting comes back up um michael i'm yeah. sorry um I, you know i'm painting with acrylic and um uh -huh. I'm just wondering if like when you're uh, demonstrating techniques, if if there's like a huge um, difference, if you could give me a heads up on that. 100%. I'm sorry. And who said that? I've not Julie. seen you. This is Julie. Oh, Julie. sorry. Great. No, that's a fantastic question. And, um, you know, I'll talk more about using acrylics too as an underpainting for oil paintings in the future. But no, you actually have an advantage over us. Um, because, yeah, definitely. In terms of like, you know, a half hour later, I can go ahead and stumble. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's yeah. And the scumbling works fairly similar. And you will notice with your acrylics that they do have opaque, transparent, you know, the same thing going on. But you also have mediums that you can add to your acrylics yeah. um, to do a lot of Gel the mediums things. are fantastic. For I'm sorry. Those gel mediums are fantastic for glazing. So yeah, so there you go, you know already. Um, and a lot of times with the, um, if you're doing scumbling, you just have to work double time. Like last night, uh, Renita and I were in a meeting together with a group of other artists. And uh, I started the painting at the beginning of the meeting and then stepped away for an hour to finish the meeting. And uh, I was able to come back and keep moving that paint around which you would absolutely not be able to do with an acrylic, unless you were using open acrylics, but I really don't know anything about those. The other thing I, did, did that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I know I have to work fast. Um, there's no, yeah. no messing around. No messing around, no breaks for you. You have to yeah. remix all your colors if you're, if you're not paying attention. Yeah, exactly. So that's why uh, having the sponge under your palette and having a mister nearby are great yeah. um, when working with acrylics. The other thing I, I plan to do with this painting is to come back in and put sky holes, meaning chop little shapes into those trees um, to make uh, like they're not just a big mass of trees, a big solid mass. Um, so I may do a little bit of that. I'll probably do that after class just because I have a couple other things I want to do. The other two paintings I intend to do when we step up to the easel are going to be smaller, uh, 10 by 10 and a 12 inch by 12 inch. Um, and the 10 by 10 I'm going to do as a almost all transparent colors. And I'm going to quickly show a different way, if you've not been in my classes, show a different way of starting a painting by doing kind of a wiping away method in the beginning. It's a subtractive style of painting. It feels more sculptural to me. I really enjoy it. In fact, that little painting on the right side there was done using the wiping away method. <coughs> um, and then the third painting, pretty, uh, uh, but let's hope we get to the third painting. But the third painting is going to be a combination of transparent and opaque paintings. Uh, uh, sorry, transparent and opaque paint. Um, and I will show that I can continue to paint wet into wet and layer. You do not have to wait for a painting to dry to do, you know, 80, 90% of your painting. Um, only if you really intend to do glazing or you intend to do scumbling. And the truth is, I will try, you know, my goal generally is to not need those things. I rarely paint unless I'm doing like a full underpainting. Um, I rarely paint just with the idea that I'm going to need to glaze. Glazing often is almost, I don't want to say a band-aid, but it's another tool I have when things aren't quite working out or when I change my mind slightly, like in the case of this water, 
where I, I really wanted it to be light and bright. And in fact, it represents the photo reference quite well. But after sitting with it for this month, I don't feel like it reads as naturally as it could. Um, does that make sense? So I can come back and glaze. I don't usually aim for it. Um, but glazing is magic. It can do some really fantastic, fantastic things. And in fact, one of your paintings in the group here, let me see who I mentioned that to, Carol, um, when I was uh, commenting on your painting this morning and you posted your reference, I said, save the painting. We're going to use it as a glazing uh, example. So it'll be great. Um, and that's up to you. You don't have to listen to me, but all right. How does that sound? That's a lot to cover, you guys. Um, but I think it's a lot of really great and important information that um, I haven't covered in as much detail as I would like to in the past. So for those returning students and for the new students, I think that's going to be uh, great. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and step up to the easel here. Was the fog on this painting scumbled in or was that? Using yeah, so I just scumbled that in last night. And now I'm going to experiment really quickly with the lighting and see. That's interesting. So that's turning off my overhead light. That makes, oh, I need to turn this one back on. So I've set up three new lights this morning with the uh, plan to see what happens if the colors are reading better and if it's a little clear and also trying to get rid of the strong sh cast shadow under my hand. Oh, it's almost gone. How does that look versus that? That's getting really strong. That kind of bleaches out areas too much, doesn't it? Yep. Are you guys seeing kind of a pulsating in there though? Hard to tell. Okay. I hope that's not the lights that are doing that. I'm just looking at my monitor and it seems to have a little bit of a flicker to it. Yeah, you know, I noticed that it's kind of uh, not just on your paint, but in the background. I actually thought you had a fish tank in there or something last ah. week. Because there's sort of, uh, you know, the, that kind of light that a fish tank will, that water will right. reflect. Um, but it's, it's not, not it's not, it's not a big deal. It, it really doesn't, I, I don't see it at all on the canvas, actually. So, well, maybe a little bit. Shadow right here as it kind of flickers in and out for whatever reason. And I don't know why that is. All right, so really quickly, do you like this? That's with the two new lights. That's with the overhead light and the two new lights. That does seem to get rid of the flicker. Nope. Yeah, it's fine. First, or, it's better. I, I agree. Or turning these off. Uh, I like that one the best. With just. <coughs> So that's just with the overhead light. That's what I used last week. That seems to wobble the image. Yeah. So with, all right, I apologize for this, but I can't really test it by myself how it looks. It seems like you can see more detail of the trees like on the left side with the way it is now compared to when the lights were brighter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's I true. I think that's good. We're liking it this way? Uh-huh. Yeah. I am. It looks good. Well, we'll try that, and we can always change it each week. Keep experimenting. Just like painting. All right, so because uh, I don't have my palette set up beside me, I'll quickly just show you what's on my easel here. A bunch of brushes. A lot of times with the scumbling, I will use a pretty beat up brush. Again, scumbling is going to be the scrubbing of dry brush. 
And that's what I'm going to do with the fog. So I'll generally use an old beat up brush for that. I don't want to be, you know, scrubbing in a beautiful, nice brush that I can preserve. And you definitely want to use a harder bristle as a general rule. Um, if you're using a soft bristle, you'll notice they'll just go flying off because scumbling is pretty brutal on your brushes. And oftentimes I'll even do it with a little bit of a paper towel as well. Um, and you definitely don't want a super soft paper towel. That's when a nice cheap kind of crusty <laughs> paper towel is a little better. Or these shop towels seem to hold up pretty well as well. So for the scumbling, um, yesterday I mixed a little bit of white and a little bit of um, different blues and a touch of quinacridone red to make kind of a purple. Um, it looks pretty just kind of gray here, which is great. And it's semi-transparent because what I did was I put the paint on and then I scrubbed it or scumbled it in until you're beginning to see the color that's underneath. It makes it almost transparent, but it's not transparent because of any kind of medium or anything else. It's Scumbling is generally done with a dry. You don't add anything to it. If I add medium or anything, it becomes more of glazing. Um, and I'm just kind of pushing it like that. Um, I'm, and then you can see I used a fairly consistent color. I put a little bit of warmer color back here. And that's kind of going to be my goal now, too, is to take a little bit. So I'm taking a little bit of my white, mixing a little bit of my Indian yellow. And I'm just going to add a dab. So my sun is kind of right in here. So the light is kind of coming through. You can see it hitting the sides of this tree and the grasses here. So I think that it's also probably going to hit the fog here a little bit. A little bit nervous here. I'm just going to add a little bit of that light hitting there. Pretty extreme. Don't worry, I'm going to come in and change that around. Also, my light is shooting back through here. So I imagine it's hitting back here and creating just a little bit of an angle. And then it's coming and coming across here. So I'm going to let it hit a little bit in front here as well. And then it's going to get back towards the shadows over here. I'm adding less of it because I don't think it's going to be as extreme. All right, so basically what I've done is just kind of put down some spots of it, clean my brush up, because I don't want a whole lot of paint. I'm going to use the paint that's on there, the, the, those little dabs that I just added. I'm just going to, and I'm going to go ahead and choke up a little bit, of, just so I have a little more control and a little more pressure on the brush. And can you guys hear that scrubbing noise? I'm just softening up, softening up, making it hopefully look kind of like fog. You can do this with clouds, you know, where you want to soften edges. You know, clouds are often, often benefit from having uh, a bit of a softer edge added to them. It's a little bit tricky. It's like dappled light, but dappled light on haze, on fog. So does that mm -hmm. kind of read like the lights touching on top of the fog just a little bit in certain areas more than others? It does to me. Right. So using, is that, are you using that good here? Here? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. What was that? <laughs> is that titanium white? Uh, you know what? I actually have a tube of transparent white, which okay. definitely makes this job a little bit easier. I've had this tube for quite a while because um, I don't use it very often, 
but boy, it's sure been kind of nice for this. Um, I did a great big vineyard painting a couple months ago and uh, boy, did it really come in handy because I decided to push all the mountains back, like add fog. It was a six foot or seven foot painting, six foot, I think. And uh, I needed a lot I, to push all the mountains. Like there was a more atmosphere than I had initially intended when I started the painting. Um, and I could have remixed all the colors and repainted it, but with the little bit of a translucent white and a little bit of a, I think I mixed kind of a purple and a blue, uh, depending on the area of the painting into that, it sure made a convincing effect and really probably sped it up a lot for me. Michael, who makes the transparent white? Uh, that's a gambling color and it's a 1980, so it's nice and inexpensive as well. I haven't experimented with it uh, as much as I probably should. I should probably uh, really literally do a painting with it um, on purpose versus keep using it to kind of modify as an afterthought. All right. So yeah, that already kind of warmed up a little bit, right? I'm going to go ahead and add a touch of pink onto the edges where the light and the shadows are meeting so that there's a little bit of a transition color. So my light coming through here and then the shadow being cast by this. So hopefully this is a little warmer than this. You see it's kind of a little yellower towards the more purple. So I'm just going to add a little bit of pink into the transitions and see how that works. Michael, would you say that again? You added pink between the transitions because why pink? Uh, because I've got yellow to purple, a yellowish color to a purple-ish color. And so I could, you know, I just was thinking what would be a nice in-between color as they transition. I don't want it to be like a hard wall because it's fog, it's soft, so it's soft edged. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh. I'm just gonna have to add a weight on here if I want to keep it down, but you guys can see that, okay? So you see where I've got the warm, the sun is right up here. So it's casting its light down along this and it's coming down in between it's hitting the fog, so I've got a cool fog, kind of a purpley gray, and a warm fog, kind of a yellowy gray. So now in the transition versus just having a hard line of warm to cool fog, I'm going to add a little bit of pink. And again, it's an experiment. I don't know if it would even show up in nature so clearly, but I thought it might make a nice transition optically. And also what I want to do, so I'm going to take this pink watch because this area would be seeing quite a lot of fog, a lot of atmosphere, and I'll warm that up. So I'm just going to bring a lot of pink. Oops, sorry, I'm blocking it with my hand there. So that it's being pushed back, but it feels like there's still warm, little oh, yeah. fog. I'm going to do the same a little bit, right? Let me just hold it with my hand here right in this area. So I'll do the same thing. I'm going to add a little bit of the pink because the light is the strongest here as it's coming across, right? So I'm going to take a little bit of this pink and scumble it in. See how that makes that area? Gosh, sorry, it keeps going in and out of focus so badly. Um, I'm trying to make it feel like the light's raking across here from the warmest closest to the sun, getting cooler, more purple, more gray, more blue, until eventually we get to dark blue over here. Mm. Does that make sense? Watch as the light is traveling across from the light source to away further from the light source. And then I'm also thinking, okay, if my light is kind of half behind this tree, it's where is it hitting? So I know that behind this tree is in shadow, right at the edges of these plants are in shadow. 
the light could also be coming across if I made an angle. So this area gets to get a little bit of light, but then the shadow behind here again. I like what it did to the fog. Where it, I like the scumbling, what it did to the fog because it makes it more like, more real, you know, how it isn't just a soft blanket sometimes. It's little bursts of fog. Yeah, exactly. I really mm -hmm. noticed that too. And sometimes I'll take little bits of fog like up, kind of like I just did here. Uh -huh. up and uh, yeah, it's not even. They kind of hang in the trees, hang in the limbs. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it could totally. So now I'm just going the in-betweens where the pink or where the purple and the yellow meet. So I'm hoping that when it hits the yellow, it'll turn just a touch orange on the edge. And where it hits the purple, and I might have to take up a little bit. I might have added too much pink. And if I did add too much pink, which I did, I simply take my paper towel and I'm just going to kind of pull that up and blend that in. It, there we go. I want a, more of a subtle transition. I didn't want strong pinks. I just, I almost don't want the viewer to see that pink. I want them to just kind of not feel really strong transition, like yellow to purple is a really big jump on the color wheel. So by adding a pink in between I've created a less of a you know massive jump optically color wise and temperature wise let's zoom out really quickly and see if that's done the effect I hope it does Michael this is such a basic question but as far as the shadows the temperatures and the shadows um, are they always going to be Cool. Not always. No, you can actually have warmer shadows if you have a cool light source. So when would cool you ever light. have a cool light source? Yeah, like in fact, sometimes like midday can have almost a cooler light source where you get that kind of blue light to it. Sometimes it's really warm. Um, also, sometimes on an overcast day, you can get a cool light source where your shadows will appear a little bit warmer. Yeah, what I like to remind people of is like, if you've, you know, been on the beach at sunset, you know, you'll go down and you're, you know, of course you're observing the sunset looking out there, but if you ever turn and look back up the sand towards, you know, the mainland, you'll see that your shadows are very purple or blue if it's on like a whitish or, you know, a goldish sand. And that's because the sunset is very, very warm. So it casts a very cold, shadow um generally i paint with warm light cool shadows it just tends to read better and it also i think for oregonians where we get so much cold and haze and you know gray days that sometimes having that warmth is something that people want in their homes um but i do sell a number of cold paintings as well cooler colors grays and stuff um so yeah that's something that um i'll ask that you observe and just kind of ask yourself am i seeing is it a warmer shadow or a cooler shadow it's rarely going to be like a bright red shadow or anything like that it's not super hot but it will be warmer and i think mostly it's just an optical thing it just appears that way i don't think it's actually really doing that as much are you dabbing in pink or was that what's that were you, were you dabbing in pink? I was actually it? still just kind of removing areas where I see it as a little too strong. So a lot of times I just kind of take my paper towel as a, as a blender and as well as just kind of a little bit of a modifier. Just, yeah, I'm just kind of going, where, where could I use a little more pink? Where could I use a little less pink? Um, yeah, so, did, so can you guys see those transitions? It's a little bit of warm to cool. I could probably warm this up even more if I wanted to, um, but I don't, yeah, maybe, we'll see. I can always just try it. So I'm adding a little more Indian yellow, a more transparent white, and I don't know, it's scary because I kind of like where it is now. 
let's see. You know what? You never know you're, you've gone too far until you go too far. So. There we go. Get back to my stumbling brush here. And there, I just cleaned it in paint thinner, thinking I was going to be a good boy and clean my brush in between use. But now I can't use that brush because it's got paint thinner on it and I wouldn't be stumbling. Even if I just squeezed it all out, it would still be on there. So I just grabbed another brush. Another beat up old brush. And, and again, that's transparent white and Indian yellow. Yeah. But it's over such a cool thing that as it becomes transparent, it kind of goes to gray pretty quick, kind of greenish, grayish. So, you know, I may need to actually paint in. If I ever want it to be, you know, a little more opaquely, if I ever want it to actually really show up, but I'm kind of thinking I like the subtlety of it. And this area is really quite dark right here. Huh. It's interesting. It's like the paint doesn't quite want to stick there. there we go. All right, what do you think? That help a little bit? It's gorgeous. All right, and then with uh, sky holes, I'll just do a little bit of that while we're, we kind of got it zoomed in here. Let's move it into that area and zoom it in. I'm grabbing a big 10 pound weight here. Hey, uh, if I pull it down, it goes back up. Hey, so Michael. I have, I have to add a weight on top. I don't know if you can hear. Now it's going to stay put when I. Hey, Michael. Yes. Hi, Susie Siegel here. Good morning. Um, could you take. Uh, titanium white gambling and thin it out with medium or even terp rather than the 1890 could you thin it out where it would do the same thing as the transparent is that an option yeah or you just push it further that's what okay. I do I just scumble it harder <laughs> okay scumble it further in between because if you're adding terp or paint thinner or anything now you're doing more of a glazing versus a scumbling and I just find for some reason when I'm light, lightening things, making them less dark, scumbling often works better okay. than glazing. Glazing almost always inevitably darkens things a little bit. It's a weird thing. And that's a good question because, yeah, that can do some odd stuff. So I'm going to come through. I'm just going to try and poke some tree holes in there. Um, looks like a little lighter than that to actually make them visible. I just got a little bit of a brush here. I'm just going to, with sky holes, often you, it's easy to go too many. Um, so I should probably kind of have a plan of where do I want the spacing. And there's kind of this naturalistic shape to some of these trees. So I might be able to use that. Um, I've made my color a little bit darker than in here. I don't want my sky holes to ever be lighter than the sky around it. Usually a touch darker. It's a little more naturalistic because not as much light is breaking through. Um, let's I'm also going to let my sky holes get a little bit darker as they get further from the light source slightly, meaning the sun over here. Too dark, a little more light. A little more white, a little more yellow. I'm still using the transparent white just because that's what I've squeezed out, but I'm putting it on thicker. I'm not, um, I'm not uh, scumbling it in. So I'm just leaving dabs of paint. 
Are you guys able to see that a little tiny sky holes? Maybe I should go somewhere where I can do a little more um, significant of one. We can we can see. Okay, great. Super is that, fun. Is that um, um, again, transparent white and the Indian yellow? Yeah, I'm just kind of trying to mimic the color. And in some of them, I've added a touch of quinacridone red. And that would be where the light's coming through, but not quite as strong. Like maybe there's some branches in there or leaves. Um, so I don't want it to be all the same. I've actually got three different, I'm going to move this. So I've got three different puddles of light paint. Well, you can't really see, but it's, it goes pinker, oranger, and yellower. And I'm just kind of deciding as I put those dabs of paint up there, is it, you know, is there a lot of light coming through? Like, is it a clearing, like a big open spot in the trees, maybe right below the canopy or something like that? Um, where more light is getting through, or is it, um, you know, just a little bit of lights coming through, like there's a bunch of leaves, but they're transparent, so the light's coming through those. Um, you can also add, just with that little bit of light, I can also add what would appear to be kind of leaves on top, so everything's not quite so solid. Let's do that right on the edge of here. I'll add a couple dabs of paint, like there's some leaves. Can you see that at all, or is that too bright? You can see. And that just kind of breaks up. If I get my trees too big and solid, they just look like big blobs of, you know, A lot of times my trees end up looking like cupcakes or ice cream cones. And so I want to generally kind of come in and carve out, but I gotta be, I gotta be thoughtful. I can't just put dabs all over the place. Like right here, there's, I can put a clearing in because it's kind of going like a bush here that wraps around. And then there's a, the canopy of the trees here. So in here's a little bit clear. I could almost, let's see if we can make it. So it appears to be, Like there's a trunk. So it's as if I'm almost pruning. Some of these holes are a little too bright. And you see that like if I put, let me just show you, if I put a really bright sky hole, in the wrong spot, watch, it'll just look crazy. You see how that just, oh, you can, that just takes all your attention and makes it go there. Because it's really, really light, surrounded by really, really dark. So I don't want that. Let's see if I did a more subtle color, if I could get away with it. So this is a little, lot redder. Still pretty bright. So I generally want kind of a transition from like this warmer areas here, I can put sky holes in there pretty much all day because it doesn't look so blinding, blindingly bright. Are you using the same color of sky holes as you are with your leaves? Yeah. Isn't that weird? Yeah. Yeah, totally. It it's, makes it actually feel better. But yeah, watch how bright it looks here. And then up here, it looks dark. Yeah, that's the big difference. Yeah. Getting a little crazy with my leaves. So I can just kind of knock those back, make them look a little softer, a little Lurier, kind of connect them a little bit. There we go. Feels a little better. I'm going to do the same with my sky holes. I often will just kind of come through. I don't want them to have the same mark. That's very, very common with um, new painters is they'll come through and like, okay, sky holes. Those are fun. Dot, 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 or dash, dash, dash. And all the sky holes look the same. They're the same shape. They're the same size. Um, you want to modify those and make them 
interesting and uh, whatever that takes. Man, I don't want to bore you with sky holes. I could do them all day, but it is kind of the candy, you know, the uh, the cherry on top when you're doing a painting. Sometimes that really just makes them come to life as long again as you don't do too, too many. I want to keep them, you know, related. I oftentimes won't put them too close to the edge either because they are exciting. They do draw our attention towards them. Um, so... Michael, I have a question. Please. So when you when you do the sky holds, do you clean your brush and go back and just caught like some of the guys call it like zipping it up, like just touch the color half on the light in, in the dark, just to soften it in place? Yeah, that's actually what I'm even doing right now is I've okay. got these little yellowy white sky holes and now I'm coming in right on the edges, putting little bits of pink around it. So again, it has a transition, just like the fog. If, is that what you meant? Yeah. 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 So yeah, oftentimes if I just have a solid dot, it just really draws too much attention. You can really, yeah. And so I'll also have to come back in and add those into the reflections. Some of these sky holes, if they're significant enough, I can ignore a lot of the little ones in the reflections. Um, but I'll do, I'm going to have to do that after we glaze. So I'm going to come back after class and, you know, keep adding sky holes because it's so fun. And I think that this painting is just looking, you know, better and better, um, at least a little more interesting, you know, and a lot of times I will do that. I'll paint till I think it's good and then sit on it. Well, not literally, but, you know, sit and look at it for a while, put it up in the studio somewhere, or I've got some spots that when I'm cooking, I can see my paintings. Um, so that, you know, I'll be cooking for a little bit, glance up really quickly and, you know, start cooking, glance up really quickly. And that gives me a chance to kind of observe the paintings in a different way and in different lighting in a different situation, you know, out of my studio and gives me an opportunity to judge them a little clearer, giving me distance and time and a different view. Um, and then I can go, you know what? it was a nice idea, but it's too boring, or it could use some dark, or it could use some sky holes, like all the trees were very much just kind of clumps, so by coming in and carving out some holes in them, carving out some holes, hopefully I'm making them a little less clumpy, <laughs> a little less cupcake, a little less whatever, I don't want these just to be thick, solid bushes, I want them to look like trees, so... Michael, on another note, I wasn't here for your last class, I mean, last semester. How did you get such a, did you start with a, I don't know, your background is so smooth and it doesn't look like there's any brush strokes at all. Is that, am I seeing that correctly? Pretty much. How did, how did you do that? Is that with a thinner? I mean, a, First you have to go get a really expensive 75 cent shop brush. <laughs> I use lots of, I mean, you may have seen that when I was showing my top of my pot, but these are all like the most expensive brush in here would be this one. And that's probably like $2, $3. They're just house painting brushes, basically. Uh -huh. And I actually get the cheapest ones because you can just throw them away. They're called chip brushes, um, C-H-I-P. And I actually buy them on, this one I painted gold to make it fancy. Um, <laughs> but um I actually buy them on Amazon in packs of 35 of each size wow. because I burn through them. Um, they, you know, they throw their hairs. They're a little bit nasty, but I can really, really just push and push and push with them because they're not dear to me. They're not, you know, and if I'm really lazy, I don't even clean them. I just throw them away. That usually doesn't happen because they actually get in the very beginning, they throw a lot of hairs. Um, so before you even start painting, when you get a brand new one, just do this a couple times, just squeeze and pull the hairs out and, uh, you'll get a lot of it out. Um, but you will spend time cleaning hairs out of your paint painting. Um, but they also get better after a couple of uses, they throw a lot less hairs that kind of got them. The good ones are still in there. And then when they get really used, they get really interesting shapes because you're just beating them up. And then after that, I'll actually go in with uh, scissors and chop them. 
and make some just really, I'll probably use this today oh. on uh, one or two of the paintings um, to make different textures and stuff. So these little cheap brushes have a lot of, they, they do a lot of heavy lifting for me. Um, and a lot of times you'll actually, you'll even see me start the next painting with these. Um, but yeah, it's a matter of putting on enough paint and it was a very subtle gradation, right? It's a, they're almost the same value. If you squint your eye, it's almost the same value, meaning the same light and dark, but it's a different temperature from cool to warm. So I put down, you know, a band of the white yellow, a band of kind of a pinker, uh, but very light, very light, lots of white. And then a band of the gray blue. And then I just kind of blended them together. Sometimes that works. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes, I mean, sometimes it works for the painting. Sometimes it looks too flat and kind of boring. And I think that it works in the sky because I wanted the focus in these trees. I wanted the focus to be the light coming across these trees and these bushes, hitting the water. And I think that was successful in the sky, but in the water itself, it just feels too boring and it feels flat. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come in, I'm gonna glaze darker blues into here with the hopes that what that does, and you guys, I'm gonna need your honest opinion when we get done here, is that it takes this flat painting and makes it appear that the water's coming towards us, right? Because really this water is going back towards that horizon line and then it kind of flattens out there. So it's kind of a, imagine like an L facing towards us, I guess. So that's my goal in darkening and adding the glazing. Did you, did you um, use a lot of medium in the background, to, again, to not have any brush strokes? I, or at least it just doesn't seem like there's a brush stroke on there. Nope, I just use a, you know, at first I'm really moving the paint and then okay. as I just get less, it's just less pressure. Okay, okay. You're, the amount of pressure that you put on your brush, whenever you're doing anything like even my sky holes and my you know fog everything is so dependent and that's such an underrated part of painting is literally the pressure you know a little bit of pressure i can just let my paint and you're going to see this actually if i can get to the third painting today is how do you paint wet into wet how do you just keep painting on a wet oil painting and it's all about pressure and our instinct is to use a lot of pressure but in fact, it's the opposite. You want to use very little pressure when you're painting wet into wet. You want to load your brush up and then let the paint sit on the top. And then the same thing goes with this. It's like feathering it out. Um, I always think that women have, you know, maybe this is kind of going to sound weirdly sexist, but I don't mean for it to at all. But I think women who wear makeup have an advantage on this uh, <laughs> theory because of the idea of feathering out the makeup. You know, you, when you put on a bit of blush or whatever, and excuse my illiteracy when it comes to makeup, but put on a bit of blush. You know, you don't want just a dot on your cheek or wherever you put it. You want to feather that out so it looks naturalistic. So the same thing goes. I will have three bands of, you know, color here. Then I put them together and then I clean my brush and I'm going to very lightly feather those out. That makes sense? Thanks. <laughs> yeah, let me know if I'm not describing. I'll try to use a lot of different metaphors. In descriptions. You know, I use a lot of house building and cooking metaphors and makeup. I haven't used that much very, very often. Um, so my, Michael, I, I want to sort of reverse that. I've actually noticed that I've gotten better at putting on my makeup by taking painting classes. Hey, hey that should be my sales point. <laughs> Michael, <laughs> makeup application. Good analogy. Yeah. Yeah, but, um, anyways, that was totally fun already, but now it's the scary part. All right. I like to tell this story because of being bold and brave and totally scared at the same time. Um, I had a painting that was 30 inches by 40 at the smallest, maybe it was 36 inches by 48 inches of Cannon Beach. Um, it was a view from up above, looking down upon the beach and the rocks and everything with these trees in the foreground. Um, I really wish I had a video of what I'm about to tell you. 
But anyways, it got sold to this really wonderful couple and they took it to their beautiful cabin out there. And uh, about an hour later called the gallery and said, it's just not gonna work. Um, and they asked if I could go out or no, I think the gallery said you should go out there and talk them into it or something or see what's not working about it. And so I went out there and it was a very gray and kind of a dull, but very atmospheric. It looked very realistic in my opinion. Um, depiction of the gray day out at Cannon Beach. And, uh, but their house was all made with very warm wood colors, uh, very reds and yellows and kind of uh, beautiful cedars and different thing. And it just didn't, it looked like a weird hole in their, in their beautiful warm interior space. And um, so, yeah, I agreed. Yeah, it's not gonna work. We should return it. And, you know, sorry about that. I appreciate your trying. And then I had the idea, what about if I glazed it with Indian yellow and a little bit of transparent earth red? And they said, are you sure? So we took it back to the gallery. And I, <laughs> it was so scary to take this great big painting and cover it with paint and then remove it so that it had this very thin transparent glaze. I, was, I knew that both of the colors were very, very transparent. But it was so crazy because I, I did it in the gallery and I started with this nice couple that was buying the painting and they were nervous. I could hear them. I made a joke about being able to hear their backsides puckering up as I, you know, put the started spreading paint all over it. And uh, then um, I turn around a little bit later and there's like 10 people watching me and I'm, you know, so now I'm going to mess up in a bunch of front of a bunch of people. And then I turn around another little while later, there's like 30 people and everybody's holding their breath as I'm just spreading this paint over this painting. It was so scary. But then when I finally took my paper towels and wiped it back away, it did. It just kind of stained the canvas so nicely. And it really, really worked. Like literally people are like, well, if you're not gonna buy it, we'll buy it. Um, it really was a better painting after doing that. And it, it did look really good and they bought it. So happy ending to a scary story. So sometimes brave works out, sometimes it doesn't. And that's painting, that's experimenting. So right now what I'm doing is I'm mixing a little bit of Gamsol with a bit of my ultramarine blue. You'll see it's gonna look, <laughs> that's really dark compared to that. Yeah. Right? All right, everybody say a little prayer <clears throat> for this happy little painting that never did nothing to nobody. Hope it survives. Okay, so I'm going to start with just that ultramarine blue and a little bit of uh, a little bit of Gamsol. I could mix a little bit of medium into this if I wanted to. It would actually make the bind of the paint probably a little bit stronger, but I don't have any medium in this painting at all. So wherever I add medium will be shiny and everything else will be dry matte. I can fix that by glazing into it at the end. I mean, not glaze, um, varnishing it at the end to unify the uh, amount of um, shine. <laughs> Scary, right? Scary every time I do it. I think with acrylic that would dry if I put that much on there before I would get a chance to blend it. Yeah, I mean, your medium should slow down the drying time a little bit, but you're possibly correct, yeah. I was sitting in a class once one time with like probably 30 people and everybody was really quiet and one girl screamed, suicide. <laughs> <laughs> and she she was doing something like that and she says oh no it's not going to work but it did work in the end the teacher helped her well, we will hope we've got about three or four minutes to make this work because it's constantly soaking into that paint below i can tell now what did you just dip into the, on the right or not the your bucket the that's the gamsol okay and what it, what it is doing, unfortunately, it's spreading the particulates of the uh, 
the paint, the color, it's spreading them out so that it looks like it's more transparent. Um, but it's also weakening the bond. But I'm actually using this paint as much like a stain as I am as a paint. I'm changing my pressure as I come across so that it appears a little bit like wave-like, like it's not just an even, even shine. I want it to have like little, the appearance of almost rivulets. Is that the right word? Little tiny waves on the top surface of the water? Rivulets? Mm. I don't know. Nice word. I'm not sure it's the right word. It sounded right. Ah. I always cringe at the idea of my mom, the English teacher, watching my class videos and just going, you didn't say that correctly. You didn't say that correctly. It's worse tell, her you, tell, tell her you're in art mode and it doesn't matter because we understand art mode. Yeah, I'm, I'm not on verbal side of my brain. I'm on the uh, That's right. side. Mom, <laughs> leave me alone. But yeah, last week when I was out at the coast, we were with my parents and my mother-in-law and my mom's a, you know English teacher and a poet at heart and poet, I guess she writes poetry sometimes. Um, and she would just keep asking me, how would you describe these waves? How would you describe the white, the light hitting the crust? And it was kind of fun. I Did you say with paint? What? <laughs> Did you answer her with paint? Let's see. I, how I, I would describe them. Here's my little wave plein air painting. Wow. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Fun. I, I really spent a long yeah. time just really almost every brush stroke is a slightly different color. Yeah. Oh, I can see that. Yeah. My first one, I guess I could show it to you guys, but and you're gonna want your money back. It was a disaster. I spent a long time on this. The sun was setting back here and I really wanted to capture it because the waves are huge. So it was making all this mist, but I just ended up having to give up. This painting, it just, uh, sometimes you just give up and start a new one. But I took a couple photos, so maybe I'll be able to revisit it. Anyways, ta-da. I like it. Good look. Yeah. Good. Wonderful. That should that looks great. Optically bring that water towards us. It does. So a lot of times it when does. people teach glazing or talk about glazing, they think about glazing the entire surface. Like, oh, you know, like I just told you that story about that painting where I covered everything with Indian yellow and earth red um, to make the whole surface. But in this instance, all I did was glaze here. I could, in theory, if I wanted to tie these in, I could probably glaze a little bit darker blue up here. Just so that they're related a little closer. Just a hint of it. And it also makes that warm, warmer when the pool is mm -hmm. cooler. It's did you do the sky in the same way with the three bands of color? I did, it's, yeah. It was okay. tricky because I had to paint up towards the edges of the trees, right? Mm -hmm. Some people would maybe paint the background first and put the trees on top. Um, I rarely do that because I like to use my sky to sh give things shape and form. Yeah, I kind of like that little band of cool up here. Wait, you said you, I thought that you did lay down those colors initially and then paint in the trees. You're saying no? No, I painted the sky and the water after the trees. Wow. Yeah, I'll share the video That's with you guys. I don't think yeah, your fellow students would mind too much. I'll, I'll post the video from that class if you would like to uh, see it. It's 
Now, Michael, for me, that the blue in that top left corner and the blue in the, across the bottom, it uh, just brings the eye right to that center shine that you want us to see. Great. And I'm wondering now, thank you. I do appreciate that. What if I cooled this down, the fog in the deep, the, the cool down the fog in the deep shadow just a bit? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now it's singing. And what are you using to deepen the fog? The same color that I just put in the water in the sky, just only French ultramarine. Or okay. ultramarine. I'm such a bad habit of calling it French ultramarine. Just ultramarine. Wow. And what it's doing when you do things like this, make darker, 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 or cooler, 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 is it brings uh -huh. the focus into this area a little more. That's perfect. Oof, I love okay. it. All right. We're one for one so far. Good. Good start. Thank you guys for letting me do that. We're going to go ahead and take a... Let's come back at 10.15, so five-minute break, seven-minute break, I guess. And I'm going to set up for the next painting. This one will be the small transparent. And uh, anyways, thank you guys for that. Hopefully, glazing and scumbling, sky holes, and transition colors all made sense. What size is the next one going to be? Uh, it's going to be a little 10-inch by 10-inch. OK. Oh, before you go, I do have one quick question, you guys. I, um, I'm just going to move the camera over before you go, before you go. Um, I prepped a whole bunch of panels yesterday. <laughs> and you see, it looks like I'm prepping them for Easter. Um, yeah. So what I did was I mixed my gesso with fluorescent yellow. Mm. fluorescent orange and fluorescent fuchsia, kind of a pink. So I, I can use this in, uh, fluorescent yellow, but I didn't know if it might be confusing. So I went ahead and prepped a couple of them with just all white. That, that would probably be a little more similar to what you'd be doing at home. So maybe I should just do this. And then maybe I can do that, um, the fluorescent underpaintings as a future to kind of show you why I do that sometimes. So what do you think? Would you why, do you, why, why do you do the fluorescent underpainting? Is it, does it make it more glowing? A little bit. So would you like to see though today's translucent painting on this? I'm gonna do the second painting on this one, which is just kind of a tannish color. Oh. I, I'd love to see it. I'd love to see it on the fluorescent because I was just looking, I get my paint from Nova and I was just looking to have all these fluorescent paints and I was thinking, wow, those are really cool. Maybe I could um, try getting some of those for underpainting. Okay. Is everybody else okay with using a fluorescent yellow underpainting? Michael. Yes. Michael? Okay. Yes. Yes. Michael? Yeah. Hi, Susie. Um, I'm not, excuse the ignorance. I don't know what fluorescent paint is. I've never heard that before. Is that oil paint? What is that? Oh, fluorescent, remember the, remember the 80s? <laughs> <laughs> before, those really bright. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I remember the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> well, the 80s where everybody was wearing those bright fluorescent clothes. Right, right. And it was just like yellow that you ha almost had to like squint your eyes at and orange. It's the or or it's the kind of paints you can use under and to make under a black light. If you remember the 70s, 60s, 70s, um, 60s, I guess it would be would be the black light era, right? Um, yes. So it would be the paint that you'd put under a black light to make it glow. Oh, okay. It's also what they do for uh, street painting sometimes to make it so we see it better at night. So it's just super bright, garish. Paint kids love painting with it because it's just so bright and colorful. Um, here's a tube of it. 
And I just use it with the acrylics, but yeah, you can see how bright that is. Just oh, so it's acrylic paint. Okay. Yeah, you want to mix if you're doing it with, so I mix it with my gesso. Okay. So you can see I start with this color, but after mixing it with my gesso, it becomes this color. Okay, got it. And you can put that over um, the gesso and paint gesso over that with oil. Is that correct? Yeah, so gesso. Okay. Yeah, gesso is the, if you buy a prepared surface, a prepared canvas, yeah. the white paint on that canvas is gesso. Unless it's oil primed. So yeah, so this has two coats of just plain white gesso. And then the final coat, I just mixed up a little bit of the color um, to make, you know, bright yellow. Hmm. So here's the bright yellow versus the white. And as you can see, what the difference is. It's just a little bit brighter, a little okay. bit lighter. I don't know if it's lighter. It just has a little bit of a different appearance. And because I'm going to be doing transparent paint for the first one, you'll be mm -hmm. you'll see some of this hinting through. Okay. Never okay, mind. Thanks. We have to take a longer break. Thanks. But anyways, we'll do it. <laughs> 